What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network. Here, continuing our very important and interesting conversation about the Taproot proposal by Peter Woolley. And this is a massive, massive Bitcoin improvement proposal bundle with three total BIPs uh, the Schnorr BIP, the Taproot BIP, and the Tap Script BIP. Uh, and all three of them are very, very important uh, to the Bitcoin Core infrastructure. And as you are running your own full node, you must understand at least to somewhat of a degree the software that you will be running and especially if it is a consensus critical soft fork uh, that we are proposing here with all three of these bips uh, so yes uh, i would say let's get now into uh, the first bip uh, the BIP Schnorr, uh, that is kind of the underlying foundational uh, yeah, level of con or, or fundamental yeah, construct that we need to tackle with here. Uh, and of course, we've already done a lot of stuff on Schnorr. I think 14 videos in general here on the World Crypto Network so far. Uh, so this is more as a additional uh, conversation now that builds on top of the prerequisite knowledge. Uh, of some of the basics of Schnorr. Uh, I would highly recommend the video with Jonas Nick uh, that I did at un uh, Understanding Bitcoin, uh, where we uh, have gone through all the important things that Schnorr uh, will cover in Bitcoin. Uh, okay, so this specifically has in the table of contacts the introduction with abstract copyright motivation, uh, the description of the design, the specification around the verification, batch verification and signing, and possible optimizations we can future, uh, improve in the future, and applications, which would be here multi-signatures and threshold signatures with music, adapter signatures, and blind signatures. Uh, and test vectors and reference code with some footnotes and acknowledgements. Uh, so all the good stuff that the BIP uh, should contain. And here again, it's Schnorr signatures for SAP, SACP256K1 by Peter Woolley. This is a draft, right? Which uh, this means it will be absolutely still in flux. We don't even yet have a BIP number. <laughs> so for now, it is just BIP Schnorr. Going into the abstract, this document proposes a standard for 64-byte Schnorr signatures over the elliptic curve SACP 256K1. And of course, this document is licensed under the two-clause BSD license. Thank you, uh, all the contributors of this open source uh, protocol. Motivation. Bitcoin has traditionally used ECDSA signatures, that el that's elliptic curve digital signature algorithm over the SECP256K1 curve for authenticating transactions. Uh, we put a signature over the transaction message with the inputs and outputs that we want to spend. These are standardized, but have a number of downsides compared to Schnorr signatures over the same curve. And there are three basic uh, improvements that we can have for Schnorr. One is the security proof. The security of Schnorr signatures is easily provable in the random oracle model assuming the elliptical curve discrete logarithm problem, ECDLP, is hard. Such a proof does not exist for ECDSA. Right? Okay, so with ECDSA, in order that we can be sure that only with the knowledge of the private key, you can produce a valid signature that corresponds to the public key. Right. Um, this, this then here would be much easier to do with Schnorr compared to ECDSA. And although it seems that ECDSA is not broken, with Schnorr we can prove it uh, much more elegantly, uh, which is very nice, especially for such high security code as the Bitcoin protocol is. We have non-malleability. ECDSA signatures are inherently malleable. A third party without access to the private key can uh, alter an existing valid signature for a given public key and message into another signature that is valid for the same key and message. Okay, uh, so basically a signature when he has the, the oh, sorry, a, a attacker, when he has the signature, which is the signature part and the random nonce part. Uh, and if he has this and the message uh, and the public key. So the message would be, for example, the Bitcoin transaction. The public key would be, well, the public key, which hash is the Bitcoin address. Uh, and with these three things, he can uh, change the signature part uh, in a sense that the same message uh, is still valid in the signature for the same public key but it is a different signature. 
And this means for Bitcoin that it is a different transaction ID. And thus, if you rely on transaction IDs for smart uh, contracts, such as, for example, Lightning Network or other off-chain accounting practices, uh, then you have a problem of transaction malleability, that a valid signature uh, can be changed uh, to regain another valid signature, that, but then changes the transaction ID. Uh, and while Sackwit fixes this, uh, but Schnorr does, uh, Sackwit kind of fixes it in a hacky way, Schnorr signatures fixes it on a cryptographic level. This issue is discussed in the BIPs 62 and 66. On the other hand, Schnorr signatures are provably non malleable. Uh, and Peter gives here a footnote. More precisely, they are strongly unforgeable under chosen message attacks, uh, which is SUF CMA, <laughs> uh, which informally means that without knowledge of the secret key, but given a valid signature of a message, it is not possible to come up with a second valid signature for the same message. Okay, uh, so you cannot change or you cannot get a new valid signature for the same message if you do not have the private key. A security proof in the random oracle model can be found, for example, in a paper by Kils, Masny, and Pan, which essentially restates the original security proof of Schnorr signatures by Poincheval and Stern more explicitly. These proofs are for the Schnorr signature variant using uh, E, which is the signature part here, the epsilon, and uh, S. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, no. Uh, I actually don't know where, what E is here. Uh, this is the signature part instead of the random nonce and the signature. See the design above. Since we use a unique encoding of R, the nonce, there is an efficiently computable bijection that maps RS to ES, uh, okay, which allows to convert a successful SUF CMA attacker for the ES variant of a successful SUF CMA attacker for the RS, which is the random number, not, and vice versa. Furthermore, the aforementioned proof consist considers a variant of Schnorr signatures without a key prefix, see the design above, but it can be verified that the proof are also correct for the variant with the key prefixing. As a result, the aforementioned security proof apply to the variant of Schnorr signature proofs in the document. Um, okay, so again, a lot of the technical jargon here, uh, but if, what is very important that we can apply uh, this, uh, under this attack, uh, we can apply the same uh, yeah, fundamental solution as was uh, proven here uh, by Point Chefla and Stern. Uh, so there exists some peer-reviewed fancy magic stuff out there that proves that this is secure. <laughs> I'm not going to go more into this because, well, stuff's complicated. <laughs> we also have the linearity of Schnorr signatures that have the remarkable property that multiple parties can collaborate to produce a signature that is valid for the sum of their public keys. This is the building block for various higher level constructions that improve efficiency and privacy, such as multi-sig and others. See the applications below. And here this linearity really is something very, very special. Uh, and uh, so the, in the sense that for multi-signature today with ECDSA, we kind of have to hack around this on a blockchain level. Right? We put all the public keys uh, and the signatures on the blockchain, and then we say it's only valid uh, if, uh, and then the nodes verify, right? If the, uh, the, there is the threshold met of the, all the public keys provided, are there enough valid signatures in this transaction to justify the threshold? But this is rather hacky. And because of the linearity of Schnorr signatures, what we can now do, and again, we will go much into more of this uh, below, uh, is that we can pr uh, produce an aggregated public key. And we put only that aggregated public key on the blockchain. And this can be generated by just summing up all the individual public keys. Uh, and we commit only to the aggregated key. And then we produce a signature by separately signing the same message with each individual private key. 
and then also aggregating that signature interactively in order to produce the aggregated signature that we then again put on the blockchain for inspection by all the uh, Bitcoin full nodes. Uh, and then we keep this or we verify that the aggregated signature is equal or is uh, in accordance with the aggregated public key. And that then can only be the case if all individual private keys or a threshold thereof has signed these, uh, this exact same message, which is multi-sig in a much more beautiful uh, way and much more sound and security oriented. And of course, privacy, a preserving way. Uh, so yeah, the advantages of Schnorr here uh, are very cool. Security proof, non-malleability and linearity. Very nice. For all these advantages, there are virtually no disadvantages apart from not being standardized. This document seeks to change that. As we propose a new standard, a number of improvements to specifics to Schnorr signatures can be made. And these would be signature encoding instead of the DER encoding for signatures, which are variable size and up to 72 bytes we can use a simple fixed 64 byte format. Right? Uh, so this will help uh, with several things, but it's good to have a general format for these signatures uh, that they can be easily, for example, calculated how much fee you have to pay, right? And it's just always 64 bytes. But this also helps, for example, I'm not sure if it helps in this case, but it might help for some filters uh, like the Golem Rice filters for the block filters for client side uh, scanning. Uh, and a neutrino or BIP 158.7. Uh, and here we need equal size um, inputs uh, for that filter. So having this uh, signature encoded in a fixed format, I think is very nice for several things that we might not even yet uh, imagine. Then we also have a batch verification. That is very important as well. The specific formulation of ECDSA signatures that is standardized cannot be verified more efficiently in batches compared to individually unless additional witness data is added. Changing the signature scheme offers an opportunity to avoid this. And here we see the uh, number of signatures uh, and the speed up of over single signature. Um, and as we see here, uh, this, this here is a, a very good uh, growth of having batch of signature verification uh, validation uh, for Schnorr signatures. Basically, this means uh, with ECDSA, we have a public key, we verify the signature. We have a public key, we verify the signature. We have a public key, we verify the signature, right? We all do these individually and afterwards. With batch verification, we can add up uh, and sum up all these uh, public keys and we can add up and sum up all the individual signatures. And then we only prove the aggregated batch, uh, the aggregate or the batched public keys and the batched signatures. Uh, and if everything is valid, then this check will return valid. But if one signature um, is not valid, then it will return that the batched signature validation is false, right? And then we need to check more clearly which address is wrong, but or which signature. But after all, if even one signature in a block is wrong, it's an invalid block. So we might just discard this. So all signatures in a block have to be valid. Uh, and they are only so if every individual signature is valid and then we can batch the signatures and pub keys and do one single calculation um, of the signature verification algorithm, which is really nice. So in this chart here, this growth shows the ratio between the time it takes to verify N signatures individually and to verify a batch of N signatures. The ratio goes up logarithmically with the number of signatures. Or in other words, the total time to verify N signatures grows with O of N log N, N over log N. Uh, by reusing the same curve as Bitcoin has used for ECDSA, private and public keys remain identical for Schnorr signatures, and we avoid introducing a new assumptions about elliptical curve group security. Um, so here again, many cool things. With batch verification, we can easily uh, or much more computationally efficiently uh, verify a batch of signatures, uh, which is very, very nice. And because we use the same ECDSA curve, uh, or sorry, this, the same elliptical curve as used with ECDSA, and now we can use the same curve with Schnorr, 
which means that the public and private keys will be the same. But the way that we calculate with these private public keys uh, is now different. Uh, and this means that we can keep the same security assumptions that we already have with Bitcoin over the Lipsack P256K1 curve, which again, well peer reviewed and everything. So uh, if we don't have to change it, let's not break it. Okay. Uh, so Piers, this was the introduction to the uh, very incredible, uh, yeah, uh, Schnorr signature BIP or BIP Schnorr, uh, the first part of this video series about this. Uh, I don't want to make these videos too long and to, to me blabbering about this too much. So we'll kind of break it up uh, every now and then. Uh, but yeah, next video will then be about the description, the design and the specification and optimizations, as well as future applications uh, of this magical uh, new thing that we have here with Schnorr. Uh, so, peers, thank you very much for joining me today on the World Crypto Network. Of course, if you like this very high-quality content, uh, you can consider tossing a couple Satoshis uh, to get us a new microphone uh, to uh, give you even more content while being on the road. Uh, so if you like this, 17 donations already, thank you very much to all the supporters of the World Crypto Network. A very kind of you. So, peers, see you on the next show. Bye-bye.